So here we are, you're staring at me. Here we are, I think it's... Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Mijan Zulu, class of 09, um, chaired by GLADA. Um, thank you for coming here today for the last of our um, Storytime Bicentennial panel. Um, when we started this little endeavor, we actually had no idea that we were going to do it. <laughs> we had um, <clears throat> been definitely trying to create more programming for by GLADA, but um, uh, Catherine and I attended a, uh, a call that was talking about the bicentennial and we started asking ourselves like what can we actually create to um, really capture this theme of there is a place for you and you know it's 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 a complex idea especially when you are of the LGBTQ plus um, experience because Williams is a very remote institution and it affects us all in different ways. And there's no way that they could make the perfect, you know, place for a queer person. But there are still things about Williams that are very enjoyable and very, um, you know, it's a, it's a profound part of all of our lives because we spent hopefully four years there. If not, you know, to each their own. Um, but in thinking about it, we realized that like, there have always been queer people that have gone at Williams, even if we didn't know about them. And it's not just the Dan Pinellos. It's like, there've been generations of people that have gone to this institution. And one of the best ways to capture that was through, you know, us telling our story and then reinserting that into the narrative of what Williams has been over the past 200 years. So it's so cool that we finally get to close the chapter with getting to the twenties, which is where we now live. And who knew that that you know, this decade could even happen. Um, <clears throat> but I think one of the things that is that has really moved us as we've done this series is that we owe so much to the people that <clears throat> have gone to Williams, that came out at Williams, that came out before Williams, that came out after, that really out of the generosity of their own spirit have tried to create this thing that we now call by Glada. Um, through various volunteers over the years. And it's been so beautiful to see that story like come to its fruition. Um, and so I'm so glad that we have the people that we have here today. Um, but what I, what I also will say is that I hope that, um, you know, especially when Williams is like a closer experience than it has been for the former panelists, um, you know, if it was a bad situation and people are watching this after we recorded or watching this now, I hope that people understand that like over time that can be healed. Um, and that's part of why we're doing this series so that we can actually capture these stories and let people know that there has always been a place for you. We've always been here, even if we didn't know that we were there. Um, so as we do the event, feel free to say hi in the chat, tell us where you're from as people have been doing. Um, also feel free to drop in questions that will work into the uh, Q&A section. Um, and then just so you know, um, as part of a um, effort to capture stories of uh, LGBTQ people, LGBTQ plus people, at Williams, um, we are recording these so that eventually when they reestablish the um, LGBTQ plus timeline of Williams, these videos will be part of that uh, web experience. So future students will watch this if they're wondering what it was like to go to school at Williams in the aughts and tens hybrid. Um, and, um, you know, we're, we're reinserting ourselves into the history of Williams College, which is why this makes me so excited and, and happy. So without further ado, um, we need to transition to introducing our panelists. So um, David Erickson from the year 2000, where are you? Hi, um, right now I am at my childhood home in Connecticut, but usually I live in DC, but I'm in the process of moving to Seattle. So I'm kind of all over right now. Amazing. Um, so to get us started, can you picture um, what it was like when you were going to Williams? Like what did you expect and how, and how did getting to Williams like meet your expectations or not meet your expectations? That's a big question. Um, I mean, in terms of like 
you know, when I graduated from high school, I was into athletics, and I was into academics, and I just wanted to go to a school that, you know, that, that felt like it fit me, and, and Williams certainly did. Um, you know, I showed up, I was on the swim team, I played water polo. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to major in, but I just wanted, you know, I was 18, and I just wanted like the real college, like experience, the small kind of rural, like very, you know, intense alumni, people who loved a college, that's where I wanted to go at the time. Um, and in terms of that, it absolutely measured up to it. I loved 95% of my time at Williams. Um, I was a JA, um, I was on the swim team, like I said, I was a tour guide one summer. Uh, the summer Gwyneth Paltrow was in town, which is super fun, there were all these celebrities. Um, and it was just really- Sandwich. But yeah, that, that, that's when the sandwich, like I, actually met her, like I shook her hand, we chatted briefly. It was, 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 that, was that when she was discovered? You were there that summer? No, this is right after she won her Oscar. Oh, okay. okay. So it, she was a BFD. It, it was very like, there were rumors Steven Spielberg flew in from the Hamptons to watch her. I saw her do As You Like It on stage she, in the old theater. Like, it was super cool. Um, yeah, Ben Affleck showed up apparently. I don't know. It was, it was, it was a crazy oh. summer. Um, but yeah, I really, mostly loved Williams. I think I look back now and I'm a little more critical of things, but I'm also a little bit more critical of myself um, because I was not out when I was in college. I didn't show up. I, I just wasn't at a point or at a place being a freshman or even quite as a junior or senior where I felt like I could be out. And I've actually fairly recently been thinking about that a lot um, wishing I had been, but also understanding that there are reasons why I wasn't. Um, and I, I, it's, it's a lot to unpack and it, it's very tied into my own personality, my own experience, um, probably due to, you know, it being 20, God, I'm the old man here, uh, <laughs> 21 years ago, 22 years ago, 23 You're not ago. the old man. <laughs> <laughs> In this group, I guess I am. Um, and so I've been you know, interrogating that a little bit, just more for myself. I do like in my spare time, I do some creative writing. I've explored that in some of my creative writing. Um, and it's interesting. I, I don't necessarily, I mean, I wish some things had been different, but everything that sort of happened led to a point where, um, you know, I really look back fondly. I like who I am. I like where I am. Um, you know, I'm married to someone I've been together with for 15 years now. Um, we got married in 2015, pretty, you know, not too long after DOMA was uh, repealed. We were on the, right in front of the light, the White House, when it was all lit up with the lights, I had pictures of us there. I mean, we really, really felt like being a part of a history, like part of history. Um, sort of my experience after Williams, uh, particularly with same-sex marriage. And yeah, I don't know where to, to end these thoughts, but I guess I'll sort of end there. Um, yeah. yeah that's, that's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, no, but I, I think we all thought these things. There's no right time to declare yourself to the world. You know, it's it's whenever you're ready. And I think that that's all something that everyone relates to. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Ian Williams. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Um, so um, if you can take yourself back um, to when you first thought before you were attending Williams, how did your experience at Williams match up to your expectations? Um, so I'm class of 2001. I, I think honestly, they matched up uh, pretty nicely. I mean, I came from, I grew up in Virginia. And I went to a Southern boarding school that was all male. And I knew that I was gay. Um, I knew in the sixth grade, I told my first person in the sixth grade. So by the time I got to thinking about college, it was gonna be a real way to express that. And when I went to visit Williams, um, I walked down Spring Street and I turned up cause I wanted to go to Hardy House. I just wanted to see 
this space that was for queer students because I, I couldn't have even fathomed anything like that going to the high school that I went to. So, and then when I got there, you know, Hardy House was on one side and um, the Black Student Union House was on the other. And I was like, this is both of what I am. And I just felt like, I guess I came out freshman year, but really I don't feel like I did. Like someone asked me and I just was honest, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so it was just, I mean, it, it matched up pretty nicely. I guess what didn't match up was um, the dating scene. Like I, well, because honestly, my parents met when they were in college. They went to two yeah. different colleges that were close. And so I just thought I would meet someone in college um, and that did not happen, but that's, that's fine. But um, it matched up pretty, pretty nicely, I think. <laughs> no, I mean, um, that, that's, that's really good to hear. I mean, I think that we all went through this. I, I definitely um, can relate to that. I think that everyone goes to college thinking that it's going to be like the, the place where all the things in your life happen. Right. And sometimes it's just where some of the things happen, <laughs> not others. Right. That's so, that is, that is so funny. Um, but thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to move to our next panelist. Um, Casey. Lyons, class of 2011. We're going to jump many years into the future. Um, can you picture what it was that you thought that you were going to experience at Williams and how did your experience match up with your expectations? Yeah, as, as the other panelists have started talking, I was like, I don't, it's really hard for me. I was not somebody who like, was like stoked about going to college. Like I didn't decide to come to Williams until I went to our like, the like freshman admit weekend um, in, in uh, which my actual, one of my big, t two major memories of that weekend. One is that it was actually the same day as the Virginia Tech shooting. Uh, in 2007 um, and I'm from the Maryland, I'm from suburban Maryland. So like, I remember being very kind of like thrown because I knew people who were at Virginia Tech that time. And, and here I was thinking about going to college and this horrific thing happened at a college event. Um, so that, that was kind of cloudy, but I was somebody who I had been understanding that I was a queer person in high school, but I was, I come from a Catholic background and so it was really wrestling with a lot of questions about what that meant for me. And I remember one of the first people I met at that Advent week weekend was Manny Yucatil, um, who uh, apparently was not out at the time, but I immediately re read, sorry Manny, as another queer person. And I was like, oh, there's gonna be other people like me here that are figuring this out. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think, I, you know, I, part of what I came to Williams was, was really that weekend being like, this is a space where I think I can I can come and I can feel at home here and, and have a time to work on myself a little bit. Um, and yeah, I think that I, I did a lot of things in college. I was very involved in, in a lot of different places. Um, I played rugby, I played music, I did some stuff with QSU. I did some stuff with, I think I put Williams Catholic in my um, bio because I was pretty involved with the Catholic Center. And I, I appreciated that because Williams was such a, a small, closely knit community that it was okay to kind of explore all those different parts of your identity and kind of see, um, see how they could be woven together. Um, and I, I don't think that was something I expected coming into to Williams, but I, I imagine, I don't know that I could have done that at a lot of other schools. I think that being in a remote place where we really only had, you know, it took us an hour to get to, the, to Albany, right? It was just like the nearest major city. Like you really were where you were. Um, the internet was obviously a thing, but like, you know, cell phones were still becoming, uh, we're not all addicted to them at the, you know, the way we are now. I think it was, I happened to be there at a very transitional moment in how we interact with people. Um, and so I'm very grateful to have been able to, to spend that time really in a bubble. And I think for me that the bubble was a positive thing. Yeah. I mean, phones were still down. So like you actually spoke to people. I mean, when I, I, like when I first... messages, I didn't text them. <laughs> I was like, please just call me. Send yeah. me email. Meet me at Peresky. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> My student job was working in the telephone office and then that job got eroded. So. <laughs> 
I didn't know we had a telephone office. And I'm only two years old. When, when students still had telephones in their rooms. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that would that only lasted for about a year. So like I was gonna say I didn't, 2006. <laughs> definitely did not have a telephone in 2007 when I started. Yeah, no, it was only the, the international students, uh well, Williams folklore for you there. Wow. Um no, but you're all of these things are so true. I think Williams was a very small school and, you know, we were allowed to explore in a safe cutoff place, you know, even if there weren't a lot of people to explore with, but there was at least that kind of like bubble that, you know, I don't even know if that's still accessible. I'll have to find out if that, if that is the case. Um, v, if you're still here, we would love to hear from you. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Oh, so many memories being flooded right now. Um, and yeah, role of hindsight is super interesting. So definitely spent a lot of my adolescence figuring out my queerness. Let's be real, a lot of my adulthood too, ongoing project. Um, in adolescence and at home, it was not safe for me to be out or express my gender and sexuality in ways that felt good. So I probably built up a very unrealistic fantasy of what going away to college was like growing up in a more controlling environment. So I kind of equated Williams and frankly, any place I would have ended up as being the place where I could be free and like there would be this magical change in my life, um, which I understand why I felt that way. And it was incredibly naive because I maybe wasn't prepared for some of the pain that would come along with um, shifting my life in that way. So I knew I wanted to be gay upon arrival and just like be out so I wouldn't have to deal with the traumatic experience of coming out to people. LOL, I see lots of people smiling and like solidarity with me. You can imagine how that went. It was really rough uh, doing that with my entry, especially when they were still doing really silly things like the privilege walk, where I remember being like the only person stepping into the circle for almost every prompt. <laughs> um, not fun. Um, but even though I had a really challenging time acclimating in terms of entry and feeling really disconnected from general class, it quickly connected me with community. And that was such a gift. I feel like I was pretty quickly able to connect with some of my people, a lot of whom are here right now, which feels really special. Um, it also helped that I didn't have to come out because I would just get clocked. Shout out to Lauren Yeiser approaching me like day two in the library at Scow uh, and me feeling like very overwhelmed and shy. Um, but yeah, I think within a month of arriving at Williams, I was able to get connected with QSU, um, Active Minds, Pure Health. Also got clocked by rugby team recruiters. So I ended up joining rugby also. And so, yeah, even though... Um, there's a lot of painful memories about being queer and being in this body on campus in general. Um, I'm forever grateful for like community I was able to develop and really got introduced to the notion of chosen family before even learning the name for that, was able to cultivate that. And that's one of the most powerful things I think I was able to experience and bring uh, with me from Williams. Yeah, yeah it's that's what's coming up for me right now. No, I mean, it's so funny. So you, Casey and I all overlapped at Williams and I definitely, I, I, I took your route, where, which is where like I went to a boarding school, was in the closet for most of boarding school, started like peeking out of the closet. And then when I got to Williams, literally was just like, it was like day two or three of the entry and they were just asked, we were just like sitting in the thing and they were like, asking about who they thought was cute. And I was like, I just started talking about guys and that's how I came out to Mantry. And it was just like, just like bashing out the door to just be out of the closet. And Williams was this freeing experience, but then also at the same time, you know, obviously it's a small school. So it's not like the most like wild and crazy, you know, experience. But I, I totally relate to everything you just said. Like it was, there was a lot of chosen family that happens at Williams. And I think that that is part of the beauty of going to a small school. You actually like choose the people and it becomes a safe space, hopefully. Um, Varun is next, I think, yes. Am I pronouncing that right? Yeah, you are. Okay. You are. Um, thank you. Um, so picture what you thought before attending Williams and how did your experience match up with your expectations? 
Yeah, this is a great question. Um, so I grew up in Palo Alto, California, which is like just a little bit south of San Francisco. Um, and I was out in high school. It like, didn't really amount to anything because no one else was out. But, um, you know, I was out, I was gay. And I remember in high school, I went to like the pride parades in San Francisco. Um, and I think I kind of was like, oh, this is what adult life is like. It's like the San Francisco pride parade, <laughs> um, which I think when I like went to Williams, I was really excited to get out of the Bay Area. Like I think the Bay Area had driven me crazy um, by the end of high school. And I was like, okay, I'm going to a small school on the East Coast. There's going to be community and it's going to be queer as fuck. Um, and it's going to be like the San Francisco Pride Parade. And it wasn't, you know, it didn't really match up uh, on that front. Um, I, I think um, there was definitely like a culture shock initially when I got to Williams. Um, I think all of, all of you who have like spent time on the West Coast versus East Coast know that there are some like key cultural differences that I think have to do with like how effusive people are or like how open and I think queerness also um, is, is part of that like expression. So I think I was expecting to see more pride flags or there to be like more pride and I didn't really find a sense of pride on campus. But um, over the years, I definitely built like a really beautiful queer family at Williams. Like a lot of my friends that I made at the beginning of Williams weren't even out um, and then came out uh, over the course of Williams. And that was like a really fun um, journey. Um, and I was a JA and I remember my entry was very queer, but they also weren't out at the beginning of freshman year. Um, and it's really sweet that some of them were like, the fact that you were so out and so ridiculous, like really helped um, them come out too. Um, and it seems to me like the tide has like turned at Williams. I think Williams, the one thing Williams could not resist is Gen Z. Like I think Gen Z came in like a queer wrecking ball. And I think it sounds like, you know, Williams is much more queer than it was when I was there. Um, and it was just starting to turn um, at the end. But yeah, I had a great, I had a great time at Williams. I think it, you know, moving to San Francisco immediately after Williams is another kind of like moment of reckoning where I was like, okay, wait, I've had some fun experiences, queer experiences at Williams, like I've dated. And then you get to the kind of like adult queer dating world, especially San Francisco is, has its like own brand. Um, and that was also like, oh my gosh, this is really like a very, <laughs> very different people on Grindr are more than like a hundred, <laughs> more than like 10 miles away. Like they're, they're close to you actually. So um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that, that answers your questions, but I think overall, I, I loved Williams. I just wish it were queer. I just wish there was like more pride and I remember my senior year just like feeling a little lonely because I was like come on guys like I'm trying so hard to make this like you know a more proud place but um hopefully it has turned um at this point yeah I I definitely think that is the case um I would love to invite all of our panelists onto the digital stage um to speak about what uh Varun just so aptly um pointed out <clears throat> uh I don't know how, how this experience was for you when you were at Williams, but um, I kind of nickname the aughts and tens as the gag era. And it's the gay after graduation and gay is inclusive of all of the LGBTQIA plus spectrum. But <clears throat> there's definitely this thing that I think started as Gen Z started becoming more of the population at Williams has kind of like, backtracked itself. But when I, my experience was, is that the people who were out when you got to Williams would increase every year that they were there. Whereas by the time I left, it felt like more that started happening sooner. But for the most part, most people would be gay until after graduation or like their senior year, they'd come out, you know, like they go study abroad, you know, have some fun times and come back and be like, this is who I am. <laughs> Was that the case for you? Are you, you're asking all of us? Of course, yeah. Um, yeah, I think by, by senior year, I remember those like Gen Z freshmen coming in and were like, there was just like a, a lot of them who were queer. Um, I think when I was a freshman, it was still kind of going in waves when I was at Williams, like there were 
some people who I could tell were on the track to be like gay after graduation. Um, and then depending on the year, there were like more out queer characters or, um, but it was still like, I think my senior year is when Gen Z like fully, fully moved in. Um, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I, um... I definitely feel like I there were a number of folks in my class who like came out like uh, like myself like within the first couple of years I actually don't know that I can name too many people who like came out again later but like we I think even our generation which this is our to, our, to this year was our 10 year reunion um like I remember 2000 the 2008 election when Obama won everybody was celebrating in Goodrich and Fiona Wilkes came up to me and was like prop 8 didn't pass like there was still like very much like gay rights, uh, you know, not that um, the marriage equality is the, the by a, a, any stretch, the epitome of gay rights, but like there was still very many, many things happening where like queerness is, was not, was still not socially acceptable in a lot of ways. And so it's, I think it's hard to, yeah, it's, it's hard to say that in some way because it's, it seems like it was not that far in the past, but like, I think it's still, you know, I, I am, I'm glad to hear that there may be more, more kids coming in now who are more able to be understanding of that part of themselves earlier. Um, but it, it makes sense to me that maybe folks, uh, even of our, you know, only 10 years ago, we're still, it still took a while to kind of figure that, figure that out because it just still didn't feel safe in a lot of, in a lot of people's experiences. I think I remember, you know, probably by my junior or senior year, you know, sort of coming more to terms internally. And I think, you know, there are certain friends off campus I had sort of reached out about or expressed some, you know, like the whole, I think I'm bisexual, you know, that type of, you know, as, as that is being like part of a, a process, at least it was for me. But I also remember thinking, well, what am I going to do with that here? Um, where would I go with it? What do I, I'll just graduate and that'll be, and then I'll, I'll figure it out. And I was, you know, frankly, quite busy. Like there was a lot happening. I did a lot of work, you know, we did, we had to, there was just a lot happening. Yeah. And for me, it was something I compartmentalized and said, I'm just going to deal with this later. Cause I didn't know what I would necessarily do with it. Not that it has to be useful, but that's what I remember thinking at the time. Um, but I do remember as things went on, I became very like pro gay, if it, whatever. And, and at that time it was mostly, Trans was not quite, was not in the lexicon as much as gay was um, and, or queer and everything. And so, but I remember, you know, writing selection committee being like, I think it's very important that we have out JAs. So even if it's not in your entry, you know that there's a JA you can go to who is out. Um, and so it was stuff like that. And I feel like maybe that sort of was my way of dipping my toes in the water um, and I remember making a point like to go to Queer Bash junior year and senior year. And that was the best party on campus by far. It was, it was always awesome. Um, and I just went as like a really like liberated, open-minded straight guy. Um, but I remember th th that was how I started to feel it out. And then I really did just put it aside until after graduation. Um, and I went to Europe after graduation. So that, that was my study abroad year afterwards. So, yeah. Is my experience. Uh, I guess, I, I mean, I have a good friend who did come out after Williams, and I guess the way I just understand it is people come to it in their own time, and there's a lot going on. So, I mean, I think for me, it was nice because there were queer people out, and that was good enough for me, at, at, you know, and I didn't have, I think I was just trying to come to terms with my own being my own person that I didn't really think too much beyond that um and just finding acceptance and friends friends that I'm friends with to this day um and I think when I meet other people who went to other colleges they're so surprised that I talked to so many people from college um because their experience is just so different than I think what we have regardless of whether you had a good experience at Williams or bad um, you know, I'm even close, uh, somewhat close to a friend who left Williams in our sophomore year. Um, you know, so it's just, 
I think it's like, cause one, like I said, one of my good friends, he came out and I don't know if we've actually ever talked about it, but I think he just started to realize that he was, and I just realized earlier or could, or wanted to think about it. Um, so yeah, I guess I, I love that people, like kids that are there now, they have so much more gay media than we had and like so much more um, even access to queer life. Like no matter where you live, you can get queer life now. Like if, if you, you know, that's an amazing thing um, to have. So, you know, I'm, I'm just grateful for my experience for the most part. No, and, and, and there's no right time to do it. I think everything happens in its own time. I do think that some of the things that um, Casey was raising like really does speak to the time. Like, like for a lot of us that are in this on the panel, like, you know, gay marriage wasn't even legal yet when we went to Williams. That didn't happen until that that was like trickling out you know what i mean and then when it happened like a lot of people got married who are now divorced uh, <laughs> that's how marriage works sometimes um sorry that's a one of my friends got married as soon as it was legal in new york and then he did get divorced but now he has a wonderful boyfriend um who he will probably get married to um but i i do think that um you know the generations have changed like i was talking to the head of the QSU, QSU last year, um, and he was, and he told me that like there are three hundred people on the QSU listserv. That's a huge number, when you think about what in relation to how many people would show up to a QSU meeting on like a random whatever Tuesday or Thursday. I when I don't know when we met. V, do you remember? I don't know. Like, I don't know, <laughs> definitely during the week, but it, it, it definitely changed. And then like, I don't even think they have queer bash anymore. I remember reading like a Williams article about that, about them not doing that party anymore. But for me, um, <laughs> guilty as charged. <laughs> um, but I do think that like things like queer bash, things like Hardy House definitely provided like safe spaces. Um, oh, this is an interesting question. What is the issue with of trans and transgender identity? Um, Chris, do you want to just ask the question? I don't want to misread it. Well, one of the things I'm I'm wondering, two things actually. One is what is the experience, what are the sort of numbers, if that can be quantified, of trans people that are um, coming to accept themselves at Williams, what kind of um, uh, acceptances uh, is that? Is it, um, you know, gender identity is um, sort of the uh, last bridge, if you will, that, that uh, the LGBTQ plus community is dealing with. So that's one question. And then the second question and, you know, break them up, is actually how at Williams currently um, do people identify as bi as opposed to the other um, identifiers? Because sometimes um, I would say the bi community kind of gets pushed to the side in some ways, and maybe I'm wrong about that, but. Very much so, some, very much so. So those are the two kind of questions that break them up or ignore them, whatever you want to do. Um, anyone can answer. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll just say, I, I could sort of say two things with, um, to me, it felt like at the time, a bi identity was at the time kind of a female thing. Like it was very much, it felt to me like Williams women who were queer women at Williams felt like they had a more visible, clear community. Whereas I don't think men at the time did. That, that's just my impression at the time. Mm -hmm. Trans issues, I don't remember being part of the discussion. Um, if you were outside of a gender studies class. I mean, within a gender studies class, sure. But I don't remember that being part of life on the campus at the time. I will say that, um, and I found this very interesting for a couple of reasons is uh, so a few years ago, I was on a, a big gay swim team in Washington, DC. 
Um, and one of the coaches was a graduate of Williams. Um, when I found this out, I was like, oh, hey, I swam at Williams too. Then we sort of went back and forth and people kept saying, Migs was uh, their nickname. Like, did you know, oh, I probably should even say these. Um, I don't want to identify people. They asked about this person's nickname. Did I know them in college? I didn't. And then someone basically told me that they are trans and I had to be told. And so this was someone who had gone to Williams after Williams transitioned and was coaching the big Jason team in DC. And I felt a little, when I asked about it, I felt a little bit of a pushback from them. Um, like, oh, I don't want to quite, I don't know. It, it felt like there was, yeah, I think you know, like I was coming from a yeah. past and I, and I didn't, I had no idea, literally, I had no idea at yeah. the time. But I just remember there was, and it could just be this person's personality being maybe more introverted or saying off. But I remember reading into that, oh, I wonder if I'm bringing up something that's really difficult for them or challenging like for trigger them. Trigger warning, yeah. Trigger, something like that, which is never my intention. Um, but there was just something that's, that's happened over the past 10 years. Um, yeah. I think it's definitely changing. I know uh, a really uh, one of one of my friends from Hardy House, as many of us know, um, uh, transitioned after college. Um, one of our QS, one of our EC members, also transitioned after college. I think that you know now is a very different time at Williams. Like I was talking to a recent student that was like that. Who is who is identifies as a cis male and he's gay and he hooked up with a bi guy whose girlfriend cheated on him with a girl. So you know, I think it's a Gen Z is a whole nother story. Um, but I, I as um, I don't know how to pronounce your name, Leoni, um, which is a beautiful name. Um, I do think that there is more room for. Um, uh, gender expression and for more parts of the spectrum. Um, one of our panelists today actually is an out trans person, um, out trans man uh, who uh, went was a was in the military and then also attended Williams. So, like you know, I think we've made strides, but I don't know if Williams was always the safest place to explore, especially for bi people, because you know people would be like, "Well, what are you doing?" You know, like, I don't, I don't know if there was like room for the, as much ambiguity in the past. Mijan, if I could just add and give a shout out to um, Justin Atkins, who was the QSU yeah. advisor um, in the period when I, when I was at Williams, uh, was an out trans man. And he was, I, I am pretty sure it was the first trans person, the first out trans person that I knew. And I think for me, it was really powerful to have somebody um, who was a resource for us just as, as queer students, um, but who also was very open about how he had worked through his identity over time and, and how he had, had, um, had his, I think, you know, had, how his identity continued to evolve over time. And um, yeah, I, I think that looking back on it, I think it was really powerful for him to be there. And I imagine it was a very difficult thing for him to do to move to rural Massachusetts and be, yeah. if not the only trans man, then probably one of very few in the general vicinity. So yeah. shout out to Justin Atkins. We don't even think I about- I wanna add on to that a little too. Um, without sharing too much, he was also basically pushed out and devalued as one of the only out trans people. And I would imagine one of the first, if not the first, um, out trans faculty. people that Williams hired, um, staff or faculty, as far as I know, if I remember reading that correctly. And so I think, yeah, to echo what points previously made, Williams is an incredibly hostile place for trans people. Um, Are you speaking about Justin or someone else? I'm saying, yeah, Justin was pushed out and not supported from an administrative perspective. Um, <laughs> yeah, Lainey. Yeah, <laughs> You hi. can speak to this a lot more. Yeah, because I'm still here. <laughs> um, so fun fact, Justin is back in Williamstown. He and his partner run an abolitionist apothecary on Colab. It's super cool. And if you come to Williams, you have to stop by. Um, oh my so God. yeah, um, 
I was going to say something else about this. Oh, right. Since um, Justin left and came back, there have been a number of other staff members who have under uh, who are trans identified and are going under transition. You know what I mean? Like going through the process. Um, so I think it's not as hostile as it has been, but um, still a lot of work to do, of course. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Wild Soul River. That's that's the place. Yeah, no, and I mean, look, Williamstown is not a perfect place. There was definitely, um, there have been a lot of protests at Williams over um, the treatment of a black trans faculty member um, being discriminated against by people of the Williamstown area community. Um, so there's still a lot of work to be done, but I do think that, you know, what is it, the, the road to progress is forward? Or Obama's had something like real much more poignant about that. <laughs> um, okay, so if if I may add, I wanted to to just pipe in on the like last last topic. Um, I was at Williams at a really interesting period, which is when Trump got elected. Um, and I yeah, trigger warning. I don't like to hear that name very much, but um, yeah. it was. I mean, I think if there was any silver lining to Trumpism, is it kind of forced people who were on the edge of issues to, you know, take a side. And I think for Williams, there was this kind of uncomfortable reckoning where, I mean, it's not like Williams like is a Republican institution, but I think there is like kind of that East Coast liberal, like there's a lot of like wealthy kids from Connecticut who were like, you know, families were pretty conservative and a lot of like sports teams um, had some of that kind of conservative energy. I think with the rise of Trumpism, people kind of had to pick a side. Um, and at least from my perspective, I think it forced a lot of people at Williams who were in that kind of like East Coast liberal, like I'm not really gonna talk about these issues, but like maybe I'm supportive. It like forced them to kind of become more supportive of like gender issues or trans issues. Um, so I was there like, as that was happening my senior year, because Trump was just so awful. I think it helped even like professors who previously wouldn't really have brought up issues of gender identity, um, really kind of had to, you know, start accepting these things and like incorporating them into the classroom, talking about pronouns that all kind of happened um, when I was there, so. Thank you, yeah. Um, so, Speaking of professors, um, so does anyone, so when you were at Williams, was there a uh, formative or important class you took and what made it so formative and important? Um, I, I can't remember the name of the class. I wanna say the name of the class was like epistemology of the closet and it was with Katie Kent. Um, that, <laughs> if for no other reason, that was the first time I ever saw Paris is Burning, which now has, it, it has like eclipsed anything we could have thought of. I mean, I think she showed clips of, um, what's that documentary, the, the, uh, where he's like, she's like, Crystal, I'm going to get you together. I can't remember, but it's, it's the, it's, it's like a drag show, but the first time I ever saw a lot of of queer imagery that was not just like, I mean, Crystal LaBeja? Yeah, whatever that documentary was, I can't remember the the, the thing. Yes, yes, Queen. So I mean, it was it was very informative to me to see like a history of queerness, um, and you know, a very big part of it was just like including black queer people um, readings like. Like I said, Paris is burning. Um, and I just remember it was, there were also a lot of, of other queer people in the class and just, I, it was, it was just very informative and, and just gave me a, a different depth of what being queer was. Cause to me at that point, it was just dating another man for the most part, right? or you know, two women being together. I don't think I thought about it in such a broad spectrum until I took that class. I took a history class called Masculinity History and Theory with Chris Waters, um, who was a fabulous professor. And I remember 
feeling like at the time was I was like, okay, you know, I'm really, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna take this class, you know? And I remember specifically writing a paper that was a queer reading of Rebel Without a Cause. And it like literally changed how I saw things. Um, really watching the movie with that in mind and seeing the subtext that's within that movie paralleled with 1950s politics was like, it really was eye-opening, it changed things. I really sort of understood texts, you know, usually film, but other things in a way that I don't think I quite felt um, in other classes. I just wish I had been able to take it before I was a senior. Um, like definitely point to that class um, and specifically that paper was quite eye-opening for me. I would say a class called Philosophy of Sex and Domination with Shay Welch. Um, she was only hired as a visiting professor, so she wasn't there for too long. Um, but yeah, she would also show up to a lot of campus events and was not shy about critiquing and calling us in as student organizers, which is incredibly valuable because I was on a track toward like liberal feminism and some respectability politics, overall queer life at Williams was so white, like in our coursework, our social spaces, et cetera. And in her class, she really centered abject bodies, ill bodies, sex workers. And yeah, for me at the time, again, in my ignorance, that was a really new perspective and a really important shift in my learning and development, both like personally and intellectually. So yeah, thanks for, opportunity to think about this memory, I'm going to reach out to Shay to share that, wherever she is. Maroon, do you have a class? Yeah, um, I was a chemistry major, but my most formative class was actually called the History of Bombay, um, and it wasn't supposed to be a tutorial. Uh, it was with like a new professor, but then only three people signed up for her class, um, which ended up being amazing. And I'm still in touch with her today, but just, I think have, it was that experience that like quintessential Williams experience where there's this back and forth with the professor and we kind of crafted the class with her um, because it was her first time teaching it. And I think that was just so beautiful. And she also like looked out for us as students in our personal lives. Um, I think, you know, some of that was born, like she had just come over to Williamstown and was like alone and, and new. And I think she was also looking out for us. And I think that was just really, really special. Um, so yeah, she took me out to dinner once in San Francisco. She was like, you're a poor grad student. I'm gonna feed you. So, um, you know, I, I really, yeah, Aparna Kapadia, she ended up getting tenure. So really, really special professor. Casey? I'm having a hard time. I, I took a lot of classes that I really enjoyed. I am very bad about remembering professors' names unlike the rest of our panelists. Um, but I think I, I was a chemistry major and I, um, I think I actually really value as much as I did not end up like going into chemistry, I did value how much those classes really got me to think about process and how, how, how to organize things in a, in a logic, logical fashion. Um, I think that's actually a skill that is still really important in the work I do today, even though they're not directly connected. You know what's so funny? Um, I love this question for just bringing up all these amazing professors who've touched our lives so profoundly, but I mean, honestly, I met some of the best professors at Williams ever, you know what I mean? Like they taught me, they taught me how to write, you know, like how to think, how to challenge things. Like when I, <clears throat> every time that I've been back to Williams, I go and visit Gage McQueenie, who is the most fabulous straight man I've ever met. Um, and I took his class freshman year and decided that I wanted to be, become an English major because I thought he was the coolest, smartest person. And if I could just be as smart as him, I would be okay in life. So, you know, but it's like for no reason other than they're just there. And we're so lucky to have professors that want to engage with students at Williams. Um, so here's a question. Um, what is your connection to Williams like now? 
Um, I will start because I think I live the closest. Um, I live in Boston or near Boston. Um, and I have found myself going out there to actually help Eves buy home. So I just helped a friend buy a second home there. I helped another friend who we both worked AV buy a home in North Adams. Um, and one of my good friends works there now as a dean. So like I go back fairly regularly. Um, and I also have been, I've done 10 years worth of work um, on the Alumni Association in Boston. So I'm still kind of connected um, to a lot of EFs around, around the area and stuff like that. So yeah, I go, I go back quite often. I didn't miss a reunion until COVID. <laughs> We got we got screwed the the two thousands, but the readings are a blast. I always go to like this sort of um, BGLTQ plus whatever the sort of happy hour, um, and it's always fun meeting people from different classes and just talking about similar to this, like how things have changed. And um, I still have plenty of friends from from Williams, probably ten to fifteen people at my wedding. So yeah, I mean I feel. Pretty connected. I would say my connection to Williams has actually been fairly tenuous. Um, I am not very good at uh, reaching out to people. So I feel like a, a lot of my friendships are still there, but I just haven't caught up with people in a while, especially over the last couple of years with COVID. It's been, uh, it's been really, as much as I think it brought a lot of people together. For me, it, it has been a more isolating experience. And I currently live in Oklahoma City and prior to that lived in Baltimore, both of which are cities that didn't really feel like they had a lot of Eve presence. Um, and so, you know, I, I really enjoy getting the class notes and things like that, but because it doesn't feel like there are a lot of people around me that I can connect with in person, I feel like it's been, it's been a little tough to keep, keep up with uh, what's going on in the college or just feel connected. Um, I'm really sad that reunion couldn't happen this year because I was looking forward to going back and hoping to get to see get to see some people in person. And I am glad to see some folks from my class uh, on the call today and hoping to maybe get a chance to catch up with you guys a little bit in the future as well. I love that Casey used the word tenuous. That's the exact word that popped into my head too. Um, I can't say I have very much like emotional attachment to Williams at a place. Um, I definitely associate it as a site of harm and trauma, both on an individual level, as well as seeing what my communities went through at the same time. While there, I did have a sense of loyalty, I think, or commitment to Williams, which is why we took over Hardy, because we wanted to make the space better for ourselves and each other. Um, so I think being more physically distanced, I just don't have that same sense of investment to be blunt to try to make it a better place. Um, and I think as always, my like sense of connection is to the people I meet as opposed to the institution or the space. Um, and so, yeah, once again, I'm so grateful for the chosen family I was able to cultivate and stay connected with um, there. And I have a cousin who's queer, who's there now. So gosh, she would be class of, 24 or something like that so yeah I just keep being, keep thinking about her because yeah her experience is so radically different than ours was um and yeah I haven't really participated in any alumni event and only reason I agreed to participate in this is because you Mijon specifically reached out for their testament to like yeah wanting to stay connected and supportive of people who made me feel held and supported while there Yeah, I've, um, I feel like I've had a pretty strong connection with William since I've left in some ways, like I've always lived with Eves in San Francisco. Um, but there have been some kind of interesting ways that my connection with Williams has changed. So I feel like my connection with queer Eves has actually strengthened since living in San Francisco. And there are people who were in other years that um, I wasn't you know, hanging out with all the time at Williams, but now that we've graduated, um, some of them live in California or San Francisco. Um, I've, those connections are actually strengthened. And actually even two weekends ago, um, I met an Eve um, 
or I, I, you know, we've been chatting in San Francisco um, and I, I took an Eve who I was not at Williams with to Folsom Street Fair for the first time. So, you know, really, really dive off, off the deep end. But yeah, I mean, I think my connection with Queer East has strengthened since being in San Francisco and then the not Queer East, I, I haven't been in um, as good touch with. So. You know, what's crazy. I'm so involved with Bike Lata. I was on the Society of Alumni. I'm involved with a with like a black alumni group called A3. I never hang out with Williams people. Like IRL. Like I have tons of long distance, like loving relationships with Williams people, but I never hang out with Williams people. And it's just, you know, it doesn't have to be like the like your whole experience. I do, I think that we take we take the best of Williams out into the world and that's what we do, but it's not everything that we do. But I'm obviously clearly very involved with the college because <laughs> here I am. <laughs> but it's it's one of those weird things where like, you know, I think I think when I graduated from Williams, as much as I loved it, I was also ready for the real world. And all the things that that would bring me, mostly boys, but <laughs> um, you know, I, I do think that your, your your relationship with the college definitely changes over time, and that you know we 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 really do evolve as human beings. Now, here's a really interesting question. So, are you? How do you? This is uh, actually one taken from current students. Um, how is being out or coming out or just being a queer person in your workplace? I'll just start. <laughs> For me, it's a breeze. Um, I work in television and media uh, sort of film. Um, one of the things I, I there, <laughs> One of the things I really appreciate about being married is I get a real quick shorthand. I just say my husband, and then like it's done. Everyone knows, falls into place. I really feel very lucky um, being, you know, basically I live DC and New York, and then I'll be moving to Seattle and probably LA. And in my industry, if anything, people think you have better taste. Um, <laughs> that's really what it comes down to. And I don't, I'm very lucky and privileged that way. Um, I know it's not the same for everybody, but I, I just say those two words and everything falls into place. And I don't need to explain anything else. I feel like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, people might do the whole like, oh, I knew a gay or like, I know a gay person or like, I went to this gay wedding once and it, I, you know, that people sort of felt the need more before, but now it just feels, I don't feel terribly special, but I also realize that's a consequence of the spaces where I live. Um, and so again, I, I feel very lucky, really. Yeah, I'll, I'll reiterate, um, living here in Boston, Massachusetts having um, gay marriage very early. Um, I, and I work in an, in, in an industry where there are a lot of other queer people that work in the same industry. Um, I don't really think twice about it. Um, it there's no consequence of being queer. Um, and, you know, it just seems not fully, I mean, I, I guess I just live in a very, a very unique place, you know, where, you know, it's very, even though Boston has its problems, it's very liberal in a lot of other ways. So I don't really, I don't really think about it, I guess. I can share a different perspective. Uh, Despite working in San Francisco, um, I, one of my jobs, I'm a professor. I'm the only queer professor in my department, one of the only ones in the whole college. Um, it is a struggle, deal with a lot of microaggressions from colleagues, um, a lot of ignorance around gender sexuality issues in general. So yeah, it can be exhausting to constantly be either an educating mode or just make the trade off like is it worth it or is it just easier to like be misgendered and put on this costume and performance and um hang my head down 
granted, my students are incredible. So I think that's really interesting as well. Even though most of my students are not queer, there's so much more um, understanding and knowledgeable about queer experiences compared to coworkers. And I think that is a way that Williams prepared me, like the harsh reality of um, coming out to my entry and then not getting the reaction I expected armored me for sure. And so just like at Williams, it led me to seek out chosen family and dedicated spaces. I think I do the same thing now and invest a lot more in community spaces and organizing spaces that are queer, black and brown trans centered. Um, so that helps me feel whole and fulfilled and helps me deal with um, being at work. And so that's for me been one of the privileges too of shifting to the remote or virtual work environment. I haven't had to deal with as many of those pain points specifically with coworkers just because we're not interacting and they're not saying ignorant things um, via Zoom DMs. Yeah, I'll add on to the, the I think that the remote piece has actually been really interesting. So I work in public health, which is also a, a generally fairly queer friendly um, uh, sector, a uh, job sector. Uh, in, I, the industry feels weird because it's largely a nonprofit. Uh, or government. Um, and most of my work has been in government. So I've always been, um, it's not the first thing I'll offer about myself, but I've always worked in workplaces where it's become clear that um, people are generally pretty chill, including when, luckily, when I moved here to Oklahoma, I was uh, glad to find that there were several other queer folks at the, the nonprofit that I worked at here before I joined the CDC, um, which that had been something that I was really worried about moving to a very red state. Um, and uh, so I was very grateful for that. Um, but yeah, it, then going into a completely remote environment, I've actually found that it does it. It feels a lot less natural to to have it come up. I don't know. Maybe it's just I also because I work I work on COVID response, and so we're very focused on <laughs> what we're doing. There's not a lot of small talk going on. It has felt strange to like to just mention, oh yeah, my partner and I are doing something this weekend, or my girlfriend. Um, it's also the first environment where I've actually had people proactively ask for my pronouns, which I've found really interesting. I wouldn't have expected a federal agency to be the first place where people were very like wanted to be sure that they were they were doing that. Um, and I was pleasantly surprised that 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 has become part of the culture there. So that was cool. Yeah, I'm currently doing my PhD at UCSF and I found that at the student level, there's a lot of queerness um, and you know, I never really have to think twice about being queer in the workplace or even like how I present, are my nails painted? Is all the paint chipping off my nails? Like, am I looking acceptable? I never have to think about that. But I think at the professor level is where you see a lot of the kind of microaggressions happening. Um, I remember once even my professor was trying to get me to apply for like a, a, a fellowship that's reserved for minorities. And I was like, what, I, this is not for me. And she's like, you can talk about your, gay stuff and I was like all right <laughs> so sometimes the professors don't get it um and um but the students absolutely get it um and UCSF is a really interesting place because it's had a very interesting role in kind of queer history especially during the um AIDS epidemic in San Francisco so the medical side of UCSF is like very tied into kind of like queer activism but the kind of more academia side, research side is sometimes a little out of touch. I could also just quickly add that, um, so I am, a, I am a television producer and I've done a lot of true crime documentaries. So I've spent quite a bit of time in police stations, first responders, detectives, all sorts of stuff. And talk to a lot of different people, a lot of different states, go into a lot of houses talking. And there are times when I, I take off my rank. Um, because as a producer, I'm not part of the story. I don't matter. I'm there to get someone else's story and I don't want it to cause, oh, you, someone saying you and your wife or something like that. So I just try and present as a blank slate. Um, but I probably wouldn't do that if I were married to a woman. Um, so I do closet myself, um, in certain spaces when I have to go into them. But I see that as part of not making... I have to go there, I have to get a story, I have to get, I, I'm focused on someone else. And the fewer questions that I bring or that someone might ask me, the better I'm doing my job. 
Um, but that is something I have to navigate that probably a heterosexual person wouldn't. I mean, I, I, I agree. I think every job is different. Um, as a performer, because um, I act and sing, um, I've, I've even had teachers who have said, hey, if you would just be a little bit more quiet about your sexuality, you'd be more successful, which I think is crazy in 2020, but this probably happened in 2019 or 2018, and I no longer speak to that person. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's different in every career. And I think that everyone makes the best decision for themselves and there's no way to judge anyone for it. I mean, when I, when I first left Williams, I thought I wanted to be an English teacher. So I worked at a charter school in Boston and it just so happened that one of the kids was probably bipolar, maybe psychotic or something. And for there to be a black gay man in their presence was a trigger. And so they would have like manic episodes um, when I was in the room. And so for me, that was a very traumatic experience because, you know, you can't be out at a middle school, like you're like the teachers are sexless, but then also there was nothing within the, this startup school to protect me from being traumatized by triggering a young like person. And so after that, I was like, well, I can't work in education because in education, the children come first, especially young children. And, and, I, and I agree with that, but I also realized it was not a safe space for me. So if I wanted to teach people, I would probably have to do it at a private school where there'd be like more, you know, there'd be a better setup for that. And I think that it's something that we all have to navigate and choose to choose ourselves first. And you don't have to be in a workplace that doesn't accept you. If that's anything that I wanna to give to the youngins. Um, but <laughs> a more fun question. Um, did you date anyone at Williams? I did, but it, it didn't last very long, but I did. Actually, I ended up dating Divine someone. Divine date. <laughs> He dated someone who lived in Northampton for quite some time. So, yeah. I, Step I, outside the box. I like it. Hey. <laughs> you got to go where the, where the getting's good, I guess. <laughs> v, can you define date? I don't know. <laughs> Um, I feel you like I tried really hard to find the love of my life at Williams it just didn't happen I didn't maybe I should have I don't know um but there's definitely a lot of joy I think as well as you know some complexity when your classmates is your support system is your dating pool is your crisis management team is your roommates when we're all these things to each other and now um my main um romantic or relationship orientation is relationship anarchy and those seeds were absolutely planted at williams and my friends and community i have who are not connected to williams think williams is a school where like 99 percent of the student body is queer and poly am and like <laughs> magic that community building i'm like no 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 that was just my like amazing chosen family very much a bubble within this larger school but yeah hearing some of my stories they mistakenly kind of extrapolate it or apply it to the whole school I'm like no no, no. <laughs> that was just my experience um and yeah I just have so much like gratitude and compassion for us us meaning like some of you who are on this call who are very much part of that like baby gays just doing our best navigating that environment so no I don't think I dated very much or very well but i don't know yeah my my first relationship actually was at williams um so yeah i did i did do some dating but i found that it was there were some like weird quirks that came along with dating at williams not from my end but i remember senior year i tried to have a party i was like okay i'm a senior i can buy alcohol for people i will buy all the alcohol we just want to have a queer party and I invited, you know, everyone across all years and none of the juniors or seniors came because they had all like 
seen each other and were like mad because there was just too much like in in fighting and I was like get your stuff together and just come to my party so I ended up having a party for a bunch of freshmen and sophomores which was fine but um yeah there were some funny quirks that came along with dating also I don't know like open relationships I came to San Francisco and I was like what is an open relationship and I don't think I was exposed to that at Williams at all or you know like I thought about like poly or whatever but I think in San Francisco I don't know if I know any closed relationships um and at Williams I knew of like one poly relationship um so yeah either way that's really funny um I definitely went on dates I don't think I really dated anyone um besides one person who um <laughs> was like a big pothead and <laughs> I broke up with him because he kept getting high without me. And, you know, that is a college relationship. I was like, this is not working. Um, and I didn't know that we were dating until a year later when I was um, in JA training. And um, <laughs> his friend came up to me. He was like, hey, me, John, like the last time we talked, you and Stefan were dating. I was like, we were? I was like, we were close, but we didn't get there. <laughs> We were hanging out. That's that hanging out was very popular at Williams. Um, <laughs> Casey, did you have an answer? I just don't, uh, you know, leave no stone unturned. Sure, I did. Um, my senior year, I did. I did have a relationship with someone um, that was very meaningful. Pretty first, uh, my first kind of serious relationship. And I look back at it fondly. Other than that, I I did not date very much. I um, was not a big uh, hookup person. And so it just was not an environment where I felt like I was comfortable, ex like exploring. That was not a part of my sexuality that I wanted to explore. I was happy to meet a lot of people. And, um, but I, yeah, just, that wasn't what I was looking for. Um, and so kind of stayed away from it. I did go on a handful of dates at the end of my sophomore year because there was, uh, I think QSU put on like a dating game. Um, I don't know if you remember this. But Where was I? This I did not happen. No, it was your junior year because I definitely was not no, there. It was 100% my sophomore year. It had to have been. Because it could not have been. Where was I? What about me? I would have been a senior. I, it had to have been because I, do not I, wasn't on campus. I wasn't on campus that se that semester of my my junior year I was I studied abroad my senior my junior spring so it had to have been but the, it was in it was in April and it was like in Pareski they had like it was like three people behind the curtain or whatever and you had and you had a person that was like the dating like like person like the, it was the dating game is like this person who was like talking to people behind the curtain and they had to pick a number or whatever and I didn't win I was not the person selected but the the person who was competing found when they found out later that I had been an option they were like actually no I did you're cool we should go so we went on a couple of dates with this person after the fact that was my one like dating dating experience this did of all the things that didn't happen while I was on campus this did not happen the most I will let you know it had to, it had to happen. Oh my God, I would have been all over that. Last year, the person was, I, it was, cause it was her senior year. Okay. I'm not trying to name people. Cause I don't, I don't know how like people feel about dredging up. Uh, yeah, stuff. you know, things you change. You get offline about this. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll talk offline. This is crazy. Um, <laughs> um, okay. Um, another question. Actually, this is really interesting. Um, so were there any marked things that happened on campus while you were there in terms of the LGBTQ experience? I mean, with like campus administration or just like campus wide? The most controversial thing I remember were the sidewalk chalking. So I don't know if those continue. Um, but that was just 
I don't know. It never it was something people talked about for two or three days after, and most people were like, "Okay, that's." Can you extrapolate? What's the sidewalk talking? Oh, okay. So maybe this isn't happening. I don't know. This was this was the thing when I was there, which is um, at at some point I think in April, um, people would go out and write things on the sidewalk. They called them chalking. So it would be queer love is as good as straight love. Sometimes they got much more graphically sexual. Yeah, um, so like like. Oh, I don't know how, how I don't want my language to get too bad here, but that was what was controversial. Was some it ran the gamut from very respectable to much more shocking things. It would sort of become a discussion where people where it was like the respect poli respectability politics discussion, where someone's saying no, like you have to realize that I'm a queer person, I have queer sex, and that's a part of it. And I'm going to write that on the sidewalk. Now people are saying no, you're turning us into caricatures, and you're you know, and it was it was a bit of a it was slightly controversial, but it was always within the campus itself. And then it would rain and it would be gone and everyone just moved on with the spring semester. That's what I remember. And then there was something about one of the, I think there might've been, a, I think it was, I don't even remember what people called it. Um, there, like a pride flag. Someone thought it had been taken down and stuffed into the mailbox of the um, head of the, I think at the time we called it the LGBTU. And someone was like, was this a hate crime? Someone was like, no, they were just giving it back. And I remember that was like a, some misunderstanding. I remember that happening. But searching my memory, I can't remember anything beyond the thing. I think it was, it was the chalkings that specifically in regard to um, queer stuff, those were, those were the things that seemed the most contentious from my memory, which is fading. As it, as it is with everyone. <laughs> I don't know if anyone remembers this, but when I was at Williams, there was a straight bash. And I can't remember what year it happened, but I just remember being very offended that the straight people felt like they needed a straight bash because queer bash at the time was a party that happened twice a year and it was like the only time when like, it was like just hundred percent okay to be like out and like making out with it, with your chosen person. Um, and I, and I wrote an article in the record about it cause I was severely offended. And I mean, obviously it went nowhere. Like there was never another straight bash. Like it was just like a one-off kind of situation, but it was just so weird that like, you know, queer bash was a very contentious thing because like people were like, oh my God, there's like porn on the walls. And I was like, yeah, because it's a queer space. We have to queer it. You know, Williams is not a queer space. And I just thought it was like so profound that it's like, you know, a lot of times people like fight over privilege. And so when they see people getting their own privilege, they feel like it's attacked. And so I feel like that was what straight bash was. It was like, oh, they get to have like a, a party where like they can just be free with their like sexuality. And I was like, that's every party, every Friday and Saturday night at Williams. So um, we only have about seven minutes left. And this is actually my favorite question of the whole series. What advice would you give to a current student? So um, I was actually asked this question in relation with uh, class notes for the guy who's my class notes officer. Um, so I do, I actually do have an answer and I think which, and it took me a while to think of it, but I think the biggest thing that I would tell someone is meet as many people and create some kind of connection slash relationship as you can, because you have no idea when and how people that you'll meet over these four years will resurface in your life. And you will go to many different places and do many different things in your life. And it's these relationships and connections um, that you'll really, really value as you get older. That, that would be my advice is meet people and connect. Um, connect however you can in whatever way you want to.
I'm always hesitant and nervous about giving advice because I don't have to live with the consequences of that. So I don't like to tell people what to do. Um, but I think something that would have been helpful for me to hear is just a reminder that Williams is not the world. And on the one hand, I learned so much about what it's like to be queer and what that could mean for me while there. And it's a little corny, but you can't be what you can't see. There's also so much more to queer life that I had no idea about that wasn't present there. Um, so I think that would have been really helpful to hear, especially when I was in earlier days of figuring myself out. I think I would just say the same. Um, it, is, it is a big part of your life while you're there and even when you're not there, I think. I mean, even if it's, even if that part of your life is rejecting what happened to you there or, or the privilege or whatever, I mean, it's, it's, it will be a big part of your life, but you'll have so many more experiences once you leave. You'll learn so much more about yourself. I mean, I think you'll learn so much more about your sexuality because like I said, there wasn't a lot of dating or, I mean, it's Williams, I think is, is very much a hookup culture. Um, and as a queer student, I didn't really hook up that much. So I learned more about relationships after, after leaving Williams. Um, and, you know, I always felt a little bit behind the eight ball in that respect to my straight counterparts because they did, they were able to have some sort of relationship on campus. Like I was just trying to think, did I really ever see guys holding hands on campus? Very, very few times I ever saw that. Um, and that's a question you have when you date your first person in the real world is like, do I feel safe enough to hold their hands? Um, so it's just, you, you'll learn a lot about, I would say academic queerness <laughs> in, in Williams, but the real learning kind of begins once you get into the real world. So just understand that that's coming. Keep yourself safe. Um, even though we have things like PrEP and everything, there are still other STDs that are running rampant <laughs> in our community. Um, and just have a good time and know that some of the people you that rocked really hard with you in the beginning may not be there at later times or they may go out of your life and come back, yeah. Yeah, I think I'll echo what Ian said that um, and, and what V said a little bit too, that like this is this is a time in your life and it's a very, it can be a lot of things, but it's, it is okay if you exit it and you still don't know who you are or what you want or, you know, we are all going to continue to be exploring a lot of things, you know, gender, sexuality, work, like, all of those things are a lifelong process and we don't have to have them all figured out at the end of Williams, we won't. <laughs> you should not expect to. Um, and the second thing I would say is take every opportunity to travel on the college's dime that you can. I still think about a couple of trips that I could have taken and did not, <laughs> that I really wish I had. So don't make that mistake. If you have the chance, do it, it's, it's worth it. Um, I'll echo what David said, which is, you know, focus on community building and building a really, you know, interesting network because I've been so surprised sometimes about which relationships have stayed strong and morphed. Um, and I think some of those random connections that I thought at the time that I was making that were kind of random have actually become, you know, really important components of my queer journey. So um, it, you know, the Williams Alumni Network never fails to surprise me with like who will you know, swing back into my life and I can learn things from and, and who will, you know, transition away and then come back in. So yeah, focus on community. Yeah. Um, and I guess I would say also, like, choose you, you know? I think a lot of times as queer people, um, we feel so much responsibility to take care of everyone besides ourselves. Like I remember being a JA, being an out JA because I wanted to be a resource for other people that were doing that. And then I actually had no one approach me. <laughs> like 
So I was like, I stayed for nothing, you know? But I think obviously you don't stay for nothing. It's good to have out to A's. It makes everyone feel more comfortable, like blah, blah, blah. But I also think that, you know, college is your time and like nothing that you're doing is wrong. I think we're, we always want to do the right thing in college, but like that's not actually possible. Everything that we're doing is fine and we will discover and enjoy and progress. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you to all of you. Um, your generosity, your candor and sharing your experience is so magical and so wonderful. And I'm so proud to have been, you know, just the little person steering the boat. Um, you are fabulous at this, Mijan. <laughs> you are really, really good. good. This is great. Oh, thank you. Um, but thank you uh, for being on the panel. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, it is 531 and I do not like to waste other people's time. Um, not that any of this was a waste, but um, thank you so much for um, adding to our little um, anecdote of LGBTQ plus peoples at Williams. Um, everyone, please be well. Thank you, Catherine, for taking care of us and steering the ship. Um, we are the EC right now is um, doing a little a refresh. So if anyone is interested in joining to help us plan events for the next year, please do reach out. Um, you all have my email because I email you all the, the time. Um, so <laughs> you can do it there. We also will be having a Rainbow of Genders Health Panel um, in November in uh, during Trans Remembrance uh, Week. Um, in which we will discuss um, uh, some of the legal things that are going on, also how to be a good ally for trans non-binary people, and then also, um, you know, a, an in-depth conversation on what it's like to have a non-binary gender questioning child. We'll have, uh, there's going to be two doctors, a psychologist, and then also my classmate who works at an LGBTQ youth center. Um, so please stay tuned for that. Um, we will be sending out the invite very soon. Um, and Catherine, did I forget anything? No, I think that's it. Okay. <laughs> we'll be in your inboxes. So just be yeah. subscribed and open our emails and yeah. we'll tell you things. <laughs> Yes. So safe travels home because I know it's a short commute and um, happy Sunday. Thank you. Bye. Bye.